This extraordinary tale unfolded during the spring of 2004 in a peaceful New Jersey suburb. A conventional family of four had recently finalized the documents to acquire their ideal house when the family's patriarch appeared to disappear without a trace. Yet the reality that came to light was much more horrifying. On October 8, 1972 in Ridgewood, Melanie Linslate came into the world. She was an exceptional, vibrant youngster, never causing any trouble and always ready to lend a hand to others. Following her high school graduation, Melanie pursued her education at Rutgers University, taking on dual majors in mathematics and psychology, and subsequently earned her degree from nursing school. Melanie secured a position at one of the nation's top reproductive medicine clinics, gaining admiration for her commitment and empathy. Her patients cherished her. To save money, she also took on a job as a waitress, all while living at her parents' home. At the same establishment, 34-year-old Bill McGuire served as a waiter. Bill, who had been married before and served in the Navy, was known for his wit, intelligence, generosity, and remarkable friendship qualities, always ready with a joke and a way to lift the spirits of those around him. A casual flirtation sparked between Melanie and Bill, drawn together by their shared wit, quickly blossoming into deep affection. McGuire found in Melanie a love he had never experienced before, and in 1999 they married. Shortly thereafter, they welcomed their first son. Bill found employment as a programmer at a tech institute in New Jersey, earning a good wage. The couple chose to settle in Woodbridge, a modest town with a population nearing 100,000. They leased a townhouse, and two outsiders appeared content in their life and in raising their son. However, Beneath the surface, they struggled to deal with Bill's unfaithfulness. Arguments often broke out over his gambling habit. Bill would venture to Atlantic City, spending nights at the casino. Sometimes he came back with substantial wins, but more often he faced hefty losses. His aim for quick wealth never materialized. Over time, his disappointments were taken out on his wife. Bill's temperament started to shift in unforeseen ways. Occasionally, he grew extremely agitated and unleashed his frustration on Melanie. Once, after getting a ticket for speeding, he exploded in anger, phoning his wife to yell at her. When she disconnected the call, he phoned again, scolding and even threatening her with physical harm for the audacity of hanging up on him. Roughly three years into their marriage, Melanie found out she was expecting their second boy. She was employed at the infertility clinic when Dr. Bradley Miller joined the team. Brad had a family with young kids. As Melanie and Bill's relationship worsened, filled with quarrels, suspicions of cheating, financial disagreements, gambling issues, and neglect, Melanie sought comfort elsewhere. She initiated a romance with the new doctor during the final stages of her pregnancy at 38 weeks. Miller was significantly kinder compared to her spouse. Despite her efforts to resist, given Bill's indifference towards their union, she eventually gave in as well. Melanie maintained her liaison with Brad as Bill pursued his own interests, yet they continued their marriage, overlooking each other's actions. The presence of their second child didn't resolve their familial issues, but concurrently, they managed to amass a significant amount of money. To prevent Bill from depleting their savings on gambling, they opted to invest in their own property. Nevertheless, agreeing on a location proved challenging. Bill was keen on relocating to his native Virginia Beach, whereas Melanie preferred purchasing a property in New Jersey and investing their funds in real estate to keep Bill away from gambling. She believed it was a wise investment and explained to her husband that she wasn't prepared to relocate far and leave behind her job at the clinic, which she cherished along with her connection with Dr. Miller. Consequently, Melanie persuaded Bill that buying a home in Woodbridge, New Jersey, was the optimal choice for their family. The search for an ideal home began. Eventually, they discovered a property with an expansive yard, perfect for their children to play and enjoy themselves. Melanie was delighted, and Bill appeared genuinely enthusiastic as well. On April 28, 2004, the transaction for their new residence was set to be finalized. At that time, Melanie was 31, 
while Bill was 39, with their sons aged three and five. Regrettably, they never occupied this upscale home. After signing the contract and completing the deal, Bill informed his friends of his joy in acquiring a home. That evening, following Bill's wine-induced slumber on the sofa, Melanie contacted her paramour, declaring her intention to seek a divorce. Yet, before she could broach the subject seriously with Bill the following day, a fierce dispute broke out. Melanie recounted that Bill revisited the home purchase topic, lamenting that he had preferred a more affordable dwelling in Virginia. Instead, influenced by his wife, they had invested all their savings in a home valued at half a million dollars. The confrontation turned physically violent. Subsequently, Bill announced his departure, asserting he would not return and admonished her against telling their children they were fatherless. Melanie suspected he had ventured to Atlantic City for gambling. Days elapsed without any contact from Bill. Eventually, Melanie acknowledged that he had permanently left her and their kids. She made no efforts to find him or express concern for his location. Now, as a de facto single mother, she managed her children's daycare arrangements and organized for their grandparents to oversee them overnight. She then consulted a divorce attorney and secured a temporary restraining order against Bill, stemming from their last altercation. On May 5, 2004, merely a week following Bill's departure from his family, two anglers accompanied by their kids at Virginia Beach came across a suitcase adrift in the water. They speculated it might be someone's lost possessions fallen off a bridge. Together, they hauled the weighty case onto their vessel, revealing it was shrouded in black trash bags. The grown-ups started to grow suspicious, but a child ripped open a bag, uncovering a ghastly view. Within were human legs cut off below the knees. The discovery left everyone on the boat in utter disbelief. Promptly, one angler dialed emergency services. The vicinity of the gruesome find was bustling with boaters and holiday-goers. Close by lay a fishing island, a residential sanctuary, and a hub for tourist entertainment, a spot frequented for leisure and family outings. Discovering a suitcase filled with human parts was the furthest from anyone's expectations. Upon the police's arrival and their preliminary inspection, it became evident this case wouldn't stand alone. As predicted, it did not. By May 11, 2004, a student on Fishing Island stumbled upon another suitcase on the beach. When she opened it, an overpowering smell of decomposition hit her as she unpacked the garbage bags, revealing a torso and a head enveloped in a clinical blanket. Then, on May 16th, a third suitcase with the rest of the body was found by an unsuspecting angler. These remains were immediately transported for forensic analysis. The coroner identified several bullet wounds across the torso, including a fatal shot to the head. The water had made it challenging to discern the victim's features. However, a forensic artist succeeded in recreating the face, providing a rough sketch for the press. On May 21st, a close acquaintance of Bill chanced upon a news segment displaying a sketch of an unidentified individual. Instantly, the face portrayed seemed eerily familiar to him, and within moments, he realized it was his friend, McGuire. He reached out to Bill's sister, who confirmed that no one had been in touch with her brother, and he had vanished following a dispute with Melanie. The acquaintance wasted no time in alerting the Virginia Beach authorities about his concerns. With a name to work with, the police quickly made a match with fingerprints on file. McGuire had a history of arrest for reckless driving, which had his fingerprints in the system. Undoubtedly, the remains encased in three separate suitcases were identified as those of William McGuire. The next step was to unravel the circumstances of how his body ended up there. Initially, the detectives invited Melanie to the local precinct. Overwhelmed with distress and tears upon receiving the news, her reaction was one of profound sorrow. However, during her subsequent visit to the Virginia Beach Police Station, she arrived accompanied by her divorce attorney and a criminal defense lawyer. This action struck the officers as somewhat peculiar. A bereaved spouse flanked by two attorneys was not a common sight. Throughout their discussion, Melanie displayed clear signs of anxiety, 
particularly when the topic of the suitcases containing the remains was broached. Initially, she denied any ownership of such luggage, yet the following day, she contacted the authorities confessing they did own a similar set. Regarding the motive behind Bill's fate, Melanie depicted him as abrasive and capable of inciting trouble, also highlighting his severe addiction to gambling. She suggested he had a tendency to borrow money and fail to return it promptly, which ultimately led to dire consequences. In the aftermath, the police undertook a thorough inspection of the couple's townhouse to gather further evidence and potentially rule out Melanie as a suspect. The interior was immaculately clean. By this time, Widow McGuire had moved out with her children, and the late husband's possessions had been given away to friends. Interestingly, Bill's items were packed in large black trash bags, akin to those discovered within the suitcases. Additionally, a blanket identical to the one enveloping Bill's head was found, its presence rationalized by Melanie's profession in nursing. Bill's vehicle was located in the parking area of the Flamingo Hotel in Atlantic City, where it was revealed that Melanie had placed it there as a reprisal for his unfaithfulness, purportedly moving it as a prank. Following the release of his remains for burial, Melanie expedited the cremation process and arranged the funeral swiftly, leaving attendees taken aback by the haste. Observers noted the service's brevity, lasting merely 10, 15 minutes, marked by a palpable sense of detachment and coldness. Melanie justified her actions by stating her new reality as a single parent necessitated moving forward with her life. The perplexity among law enforcement stemmed from the discovery of Bill's remains in Virginia, far from his home in New Jersey. Nonetheless, investigators were convinced of Melanie's involvement in his tragic end. The probe into Bill McGuire's death was escalated to a high priority. Given the gunshot wounds, the police delved into Melanie's recent acquisition of a firearm, discovering she had purchased a pistol in a neighboring state merely two days before the uproar ensued. Initially, Melanie denied the presence of any firearm in their residence. However, in a later interrogation, she confessed to purchasing the pistol on Bill's behalf, citing his concerns over failing a background check due to past traffic infractions. He purportedly needed the gun for self-defense. The case grew more suspicious with each coincidental discovery. Law enforcement resorted to tapping Melanie's phone communications, hoping she might unwittingly reveal her culpability. This intensive surveillance resulted in over 500 hours of recorded conversations. It was within these recordings that the police uncovered Melanie's extramarital affair with Dr. Miller, an element that post Bill's demise emerged as a potential motive for murder. The inquiry then shifted to explore any possible involvement of Dr. Miller in McGuire's murder. The logistics of how a small-statured nurse could manage to dismember a body and distribute it across three suitcases raised questions. When detectives confronted Miller about these suspicions, he, a married man with young children, refuted all claims of involvement. To substantiate his innocence, he consented to wear a wire during an encounter with Melanie an action that eventually absolved him of any suspicion in the case. Nonetheless, a fresh lead surfaced. The police ascertained via toll records that Melanie made a trip to Delaware on May 4th. This journey was significant because it took her over a bridge spanning the Chesapeake Bay. It was here on May 5th that anglers and youngsters stumbled upon the initial suitcase holding Bill's body parts. Melanie maintained that her voyage to Delaware was motivated by the lower prices of furniture available there. Yet, pausing on the bridge to discard three suitcases through an open window would have seemed odd, especially in an area typically congested with dense traffic. The bulk of evidence leaned towards Melanie, yet it remained indirect. The district attorney's office was in need of further details to pinpoint the exact location and timing of the murder and to ascertain how Bill ended up in the Chesapeake Bay. An initial inspection of their residence didn't turn up anything conclusive, leading to the decision to carry out several more thorough searches to catch any overlooked evidence. A second, more detailed examination was conducted. They undertook various chemical analyses and even extracted segments of piping for closer scrutiny, but still no direct evidence of a crime committed within those walls emerged. Subsequently, 
a meticulous examination of Bill's automobile uncovered evidence that could potentially crack the case wide open. Inside, investigators discovered two syringes and a vial of chlorine solution, prescribed by Dr. Bradley Miller. Remarkably, traces of the same chlorine solution appeared in Bill's cab service records, but the revelations didn't stop there. After scrutinizing minute residues found in McGuire's car, investigators identified minuscule fragments of human tissue, which the press would label as human sawdust, unmistakably linked to Bill, alongside a bullet shard entwined with tiny pieces of dark green cloth. A couch of the same color had once been a fixture in the McGuire residence. When questioned about the formula for the chlorine concoction, Bradley glanced at the document and denied that the signature was his, suggesting instead it was Melanie's doing. The investigative team then posited that Melanie had acquired a firearm two days prior to Bill's mysterious disappearance. She had pilfered a notepad bearing Miller's prescription letterhead to forge a prescription for the chlorine solution, procured from a drugstore shortly before the murder. Melanie bided her time until the day they finalized the purchase of their dream house, after which Bill abruptly went missing. It seemed Melanie had carefully orchestrated her spouse's murder with nearly impeccable precision. She spiked her husband's drink with the chlorine solution to render him unconscious, then, employing a sofa cushion as a makeshift silencer, shot him. Subsequently, she transported his remains to another location. The following morning, she dropped her children at a daycare facility, arranging for their collection by her parents. With the children out of the way, she dismembered his body using a power saw into three segments, encased them in suitcases, and meticulously eradicated any blood traces at the scene, making it appear as though nothing untoward had occurred. The sofa, now an inconvenient piece of evidence, was disposed of alongside other household items during the move. Subsequently, Melanie embarked on a journey to Virginia Beach in her vehicle, a trek lasting seven hours in one direction. It was during this time she was observed on a toll road. She then discarded the suitcases off a bridge near Chesapeake Bay before heading back. Afterwards, she utilized Bill's automobile to go to Atlantic City, where she left it in the parking lot of the Flamingo Hotel and took a taxi back, paying the fare in cash. Melanie's oversight was that despite her thorough efforts to cleanse the crime scene, she overlooked the footwear she had on while disassembling her husband's body. In transporting his vehicle to Atlantic City, she transferred minuscule human remains particles to the car's floor mat, adhered to her shoes. On June 2, 2005, Melanie faced charges, was apprehended, yet was released on a $750,000 bond. Pending her trial, her offspring were removed and placed in the custodial care of Bill's sister who permitted supervised encounters with Melanie. Following her release on bail, Melanie encountered additional allegations on October 11, 2005, leading to an increase in her bail to $2 million, yet she was released once more. While free, Melanie assembled a renowned defense team. Her attorneys contended that the seemingly incriminating coincidences were explainable and that there was no direct evidence linking her to the crime. Nevertheless, the prosecution built a strong case with new incriminating evidence sourced from the family's home computer. Forensic analysis of the hard drive unveiled search queries such as methods to illegally acquire weapons, untraceable poisons, and ways to commit murder. The prosecution maintained that Melanie conducted these searches, indicating long-term planning of the crime. However, Melanie's legal team emphasized that the computer was accessible to the whole family, making it challenging to pinpoint who exactly made these searches. The plastic bags found with human remains and the clothing bags Melanie surrendered were produced by the same manufacturer. The discovery of animal fur on the bags, despite the family not owning pets, added to the mystery. Nearly three years post-crime, Melanie McGuire's trial commenced on March 5, 2007. The prosecution argued her motive was to begin anew with her paramour. Bradley Miller's testimony during the trial startled Melanie and placed him in a precarious situation, revealing his affair in a very public manner and compelling him to testify against Melanie to prevent further damage to his personal life. 
Ultimately, the jury commenced its deliberations. The prosecution was anxious about whether they had sufficiently proven Melanie McGuire's culpability to the jury. They pondered if the jury could accept that a small, seemingly innocent nurse was capable of such a heinous act. In July 2007, at 34 years of age, Melanie McGuire was condemned to life in prison, eligible for parole only after serving 66 years. Her future would now be confined within the walls of a prison cell. Her defense team was baffled by her conviction amidst significant reasonable doubt and vowed to continue advocating for her. Melanie pursued numerous appeals, all of which were rejected. At present, she is adapting to a life devoid of freedom, away from raising her children and missing out on her prime years. This is the end of the story. Like the video and leave your thoughts in the comments. This was Jeremy. See you soon.